Welcome everyone to another exciting episode of CRE Exchange. I'm Cole Perry, your host and senior market analyst at Altus Group, a leading provider of asset and fund intelligence. I'm joined by Omar El Sarai, our U.S. Director of Research. Together, we'll share the latest news and trends in the U.S. commercial real estate market. Omar, it's good to be with you. Glad to be here. So today is January 29th, um, but I want to hear what caught your attention in the last couple of weeks. I know it's been pretty busy. Yep. So uh, we'll start top of the house with uh, a lot of central bank uh, activity. So starting on the 18th of January, the Bank of Japan, um, I would say, is solidly in the pause camp as it had no change and held its benchmark short term overnight coal rate steady at uh, a negative 10 basis points. This marks the sixth consecutive meeting without a change. And uh, while, while the bank continues to pursue its ultra loose monetary policy, um, it, it's doing so really to, in an effort to stimulate economic growth and combat deflation. That's, uh, I would say, maybe not entirely unique, but is uh, amongst the, the larger banks and larger economies, uh, I would say that, that definitely stands out while everybody else is trying to uh, tame inflation. Uh, but then on the 20th, People's Bank of China, they made some changes to the reserve ratio requirement. Um, and so what they announced is that this requirement will be cut uh, by 50 basis points um, starting on, in early February and should provide around uh, 1 trillion yuan in long-term capital to the, the Chinese economy. And this is the first reduction in the reserve requirements this year, um, but it does follow two cuts from last year. Uh, the PBOC also said that uh, there's room for further monetary policy easing um, and announced that there will be new policy uh, to support the loans for high quality real estate developers. Their real estate sector is uh, going through a pretty a pretty uh, significant, I would say, crisis. Um, and uh, it plays a very significant role in their economy. And so uh, their, their central bank is uh, stepping up efforts to uh, support that. Um, then on the 24th, uh, the Bank of Canada held its target rate for the overnight rate at 5%, uh, with the bank rate at five and a quarter percent and the deposit rate at 5%, keeping its monetary policy in restrictive territory. Um, I read a number of uh, articles around the, uh, I would say there's this restrictive territory is not appreciated by many business leaders um, and uh, a lot of calls for uh, the central bank to, to, to start easing. Then hopping over to Europe on the 25th, uh, the ECB or the European Central Bank uh, really in their press conference it really stressed the bank's reliance on data when making decisions. Um, I feel as though that is a, a common uh, thread that uh, crosses the Atlantic. Um, and ultimately, the ECB is holding rates where they are for now. Um, but markets are signaling that they expect uh, cuts could, could start and be on the docket uh, as early as this summer. And then finally, uh, back to back home uh, to the U.S. Uh, while we are recording on on, on Monday the 29th, it is uh, it, it's a big week for the the Fed, uh, which should be uh, sharing its policy rate decision uh, with markets on the 31st. Um, they're looking at futures markets. There's a pretty clear majority of investors anticipating no change at this first meeting. Uh, but if you look at the odds of uh, cuts throughout this year, the markets are really pricing in at least six cuts starting potentially as early as March, which would be the next meeting. Now, this is, uh, you know, six cuts uh, if each cut were 25 basis points or in total. Markets are anticipating 150 basis points or 1.5% uh, in total cuts for 2024. This is really in sharp contrast to the Fed's approximate three cuts or 75 basis points expected through the year. Um, even though we are just starting 2024 or, you know, we're about a month in, 
really, I think all eyes are still very much on, on the Fed and interest rates. And then I'm going to hop outside of the central bank land and uh, touch on PCE and personal income and outlays uh, that were that was released uh, last week. Uh, personal income increased by 60 billion or about 30 basis points at a monthly rate in December and personal consumption expenditures or PCE increased at 133.9 billion or 70 basis points at a monthly rate. Now, the PCE price index increased uh, 0.2% month on month or 2.6% year on year. And core PCE, uh, which excludes food and energy, increased at 20 basis points month on month or 2.9% year on year during the final month of 2023. Overall, this was a, a welcome print for the market as it really shows that uh, I would say that the strength of the, the U.S. consumer in terms of ability and willingness uh, to spend um, and coupled this with, uh, I would say, the inflationary uh, read and inflationary pressures, it really goes to the, the whole narrative that, uh, you know, either a soft or no landing really seems to be possible for the U.S. Uh, economy. And Cole, I know you were looking at some uh, macro indicators as well. What, what did you see? Yeah, last week was a, a big release week. Um, and, and the one I was paying attention to was GDP. So uh, Bureau of Economic Analysis released its advance estimate for the uh, fourth quarter of 2023 uh, and for real GDP. And it showed a seasonally adjusted annualized growth rate of 3.3%. So that really blew past economist expectations of, of 2%. Um, and just like you mentioned, I, the bulk of that growth came from personal consumption. So about 1.9% of that 3.3%. That was followed by government consumption, which is about 0.56% net exports. Of, uh, so that was 0.3%. And uh, private investment came in uh, kind of at the bottom of that heap at 0.4%. At but the, the bottom line here is that the U.S. economy grew sort of way faster than a lot expected in the fourth quarter. Um, so even as job growth slows, consumer spending cools, housing market remains relatively frozen, the uh, you know, consumer is very strong um, and inflation is continuing to subside. So, um, you know, as, as you mentioned earlier, uh, the, the market has sort of priced in some, some of these potential cuts and uh, REITs have definitely already priced this in. Um, and so it should be interesting to see what happens this week and then probably later um, as the market reacts. But um, I know that's not the only thing you were looking at. So um, the last week we got some information on uh, leading economic indicators. You want to tell us about those? Yeah. So on the 22nd of January, the conference board released its leading economic index or LEI, uh, which provides an early indication of significant turning points in the business cycle and where the economy is heading in the near term. Um, and in December, the index fell by uh, 10 basis points to 103.1. Um, now, this minor decline comes after a 50 basis point decline in November. Um, and the trend is that even though there are declines in the uh, overall index, these declines are getting smaller and smaller. Um, and in the most recent release, six of the 10 leading indicators that really make up the index were positive. Uh, but despite the positivity of, of, of these uh, constituents or, or, or components, they were more than offset by really three other components. So that was uh, weak manufacturing, uh, high interest rate environment, as well as uh, still dep ra rather depressed but improving consumer confidence. Um, in the press release, the conference board noted that uh, they expect GDP growth to turn negative in Q2 and Q3 of 2024, but begin to recover late in the year. I thought this was a pretty interesting uh, read, you know, this is an index that I, I do like to follow. And I felt as though that that call for Q2, Q3 uh, contraction, what it uh, seems to break 
uh, a, a little bit more of the, the, the broader narrative. Um, and so I know that uh, you were looking at consumer sentiment. What, what did you see? Yeah, I think these pair quite interestingly. There's been a kind of a change over the last few months in consumer sentiment. You know, we were at historic lows. Um, however, in January, um, it jumped 13% um, over the month prior. So it's now at its highest level since 2021, as we were kind of exiting the pandemic. Um, it, you know, there was a, a huge surge in, in economic activity um, with all that money pumped into the economy. But we're still well below the 2014 to 2019 average. Um, the, the, the quote from University of Michigan, who, who operates the Consumer Sur uh, Sentiment Survey, said that for the second straight month, all five index components rose, and there was a 27% surge in short-run outlook for business conditions and a 14% gain in current uh, personal finances, which I thought was quite interesting because you, you're, you're hearing possibilities of consumer credit deterioration. I think we covered that a little bit on, on an episode or two ago, but um, quite interesting. And I think uh, one of the big components into people's perceptions of their personal finances is housing. One of the other things that I was looking at uh, this past week, we got data on new and existing home sales. Um, so the Department of Housing and uh, Urban Development, or HUD, um, tracks existing home sales and they showed 3.8 million existing home sales um, in December. The National Association of Realtors, on the other hand, shows uh, new home sales, and those clocked in at 660,000. So a combined total of around 4.5 million, uh, which is down still 5% from a year ago, which is down quite a bit from the year prior. Um, historically speaking, New home sales have made up around 10% of all single family home sales. So only talking about single family here for the time being. In December, they actually made up 15%. So the total volume was 27% below the average month for, you know, any period since 2000 or any monthly period. Um, so, you know, take all this in. High mortgage interest rates kind of continue to keep existing homes off the market. You've seen that reflected in the fraction of sales um, that are in new homes, because that's really the only supply that's that a lot of the supply that's coming online. Um, but, you know, I think for us in our industry, the, the chronic housing supply shortage and these high mortgage interest rates um, still a boon for those in the build to rent or multifamily sectors. So, so quite interesting stuff there. Um, I think one of the other things that me and you have looked at over the past few weeks, that's a good barometer for, for where the economy is going. You know, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the data points we look at lag a bit, but we do get some good commentary from earnings calls. Um, you were looking at regional banks. You want to tell us what you saw there? Yeah. So I tuned into a few calls and then otherwise rent transcripts for others were very much knee deep in earnings. Um, and, uh, yeah, more, more, more transcripts than I had time, but, um, looking at a number of the regional banks that have reported, uh, fourth quarter earnings, I would call out a, a, a few quick trends, um, in, in themes that I'm seeing a, across the calls and in the transcripts. So the first is that, uh, many of the regional banks are reporting declines in, in total deposits and net interest margins or NIM, um. And this is uh, during, uh, th this is both quarter over quarter from third quarter to fourth quarter of 2023, as well as uh, year on year. Um, two banks, uh, Truist and KeyCorp, were, I would say, rare, and they were actually able to re report sequential NIM increases during the fourth quarter, uh, but these remained below 10 basis points. Um, another theme is that year over year earnings trends uh, were overall down in the fourth quarter, and they they continue to, I would say, many of these uh, institutions are are uh, finding it a bit difficult to to post uh, positive earnings gains. Um, and then the third theme that I would call out is uh, partially because it's uh, you know this podcast uh, is is the focus on commercial real estate. Um, so from Truist. Uh, they noted structural challenges in commercial real estate, particularly in office, no surprise, um, which they noted has uh, really 
they anticipate seeing more risk materializing across the sector, uh, not necessarily in their credit book, but uh, really with uh, across assets that have leases coming due um, as, as people and companies really resize their, their space needs. I know that, uh, you know, there's a lot of focus on office, uh, but during the call, they were able to, you know, uh, add, add some color to, to further that conversation. Um, and then another piece on CRE is, is coming from m and um, They continue to build their ALLL or their uh, loan loss reserve um, and ultimately uh, built it to 1.59 of their total loans. Um, this is up 13 basis points from year end 2022. And this build was primarily driven by CRE loans. Um, but they also had a lot of good commentary in there and received a lot of questions uh, focused on CRE. Um, and during the Q&A portion of the call, they, they did mention that they've, they've gone through nearly 60% of their entire CRE book, really uh, for risk monitoring and, and, and uh, risk review. Um, and when asked what type of declines they've seen uh, in terms of values, they said on average they've seen um, roughly 20% decline in values uh, across their book and the loans that they reviewed. Um, and I, Cole, I believe you were you were looking at uh, some transportation and airlines. What what did you hear? Yeah, you know, I think we we tend to track uh, when we listen to earnings calls, we have those sectors that are sort of directly related to CRE. You know, we've got the REITs and then you've got banks who finance those transactions, just like you were talking about. But um, one of the sectors that's really interesting to me that uh, I, I think we can glean a lot from is the airline sector. So um, one of the first things that you cut as a consumer is your travel spend. Um, and so I think they feel the brunt of that. But also, this is a good indicator of you know, what hospitality might look like um, in the coming months. So uh, all the big four airlines, so United, Delta, American, and Southwest, which make up a little bit more than two thirds of total market share in the U.S., um, they, all, they have all reported up to this date. Um, they all saw a revenue increase. American led that pack with 19%. Um, United saw a 14% jump in revenue. Um, they each had about 17 billion in revenue. Uh, profitability results were a bit mixed. So American, Delta, and United had positive uh, net income. Southwest, interestingly, re reported a net loss. Um, but the commentary from me is, is really where, uh, where it gets interesting. So all airlines did note um, strong demand for leisure travel. So uh, this is something we've heard in various other indicators that the consumer is still very strong here in the United States. Um, but a lot of that travel is, um, is for international, right? So they're still hearing a lot of uh, demand for, we're still feeling a lot of demand for international travel. Um, there is still lagging demand for a lot of business travel. Um, you know, I've noticed at least when I've been booking flights that they now ask, like whether you're flying for, I think even on American, they, they force you to choose whether you're, you're flying for business or, or for personal travel. Um, and so they're saying that business travel has, uh, remains pretty slow. Um, and I think there's an obvious impact there for certain types of hospitality, your convention, uh, hotels and other large format. Um, so quite, quite interesting stuff there. Other business oriented hospitality, um, sectors. Um, all the airlines are concerned a bit about capacity constraints. Um, so this is impacting their pot, you know, profitability, uh, probably leading as well to higher fares and impacting general travel affordability, which I think can have direct impact on some of the, you know, we'll call them lower cost, uh, destinations that a lot of these airlines tend to apply to. Um, so it should be interesting as we enter 2024. So overall, a uh, rosier picture for the airline industry. They did have a great quarter. Leisure travel is driving a lot of their growth. Business travel is lagging. Um, I think it'll probably pose some challenges for the hospitality. It could pose some challenges for hospitality going forward, but it uh, still seems like a, a strong uh, consumer here in the U.S. that is spending. Um, there's quite a positive outlook, and uh, you, that was reflected in a lot of the commentary from executives on these calls. Um, so super interesting stuff there. I don't know if you had any thoughts on the 
a hospitality industry, but I found that to be quite interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, I think hospitality has been booming and uh, largely driven by, you know, the consumer uh, who has gotten a higher wage or uh, is making more money uh, and uh, is willing to spend. I think it's uh, especially the, the airlines will be an interesting gauge on to see if and when uh, and by how much uh, any, any sort of consumer pullback uh, really materializes. Um, and, you know, uh, it's interesting, you know, maybe not interesting. I, I can make myself laugh in terms of uh, the, uh, this will be, I think the airlines are a good gauge on, on kind of like the landing, right? Um, that the economy might have. Uh, but in, in rather than me rambling on around uh, uh, consumer spending, I know you were, uh, you recently wrote a piece on uh, a different type of spending. And uh, uh, do you want to you wanna share some of that? Yeah, so I, I've got a new piece live on the Altus Insights page um, about uh, particularly the grocery sector. And so uh, the idea behind this piece is that with sort of these post-pandemic transitions, uh, we've got some elasticity in different spending categories um, due to some of these trends, right? We have the rise in remote work, um, the popularity of digital entertainment. And so these have kind of forced spending into different categories or cut them out of more traditional ones. Um, so the, the brick and mortar retail sector though, has really enjoyed sort of an unexpected rally recently. Um, but this is very varied by tenant type. So, um, in recent quarters and particularly with, um, quarter four data coming in the, uh, you know, those sectors tied or those tenant types tied closely to housing and construction have seen big year on year declines. Um, but grocery and general merchandise, so that's inclusive of say Walmart and Target have, have seen big, um, growth, uh, in, in line with their pre-pandemic trend. Um, so we know grocery was kind of a big bright spot during the pandemic. And, um, we looked at some data that suggested they really do those centers anchored by grocery have big key performance advantages over other types of strip retail. So higher occupancy, uh, fewer tenants rolling in the short term. Um, and they've had these advantages even going into the pandemic. So I think uh, a sector definitely worth watching. And, uh, you know, property transactions are down across all the major categories, something we've talked about plenty of times on the podcast. Um, but there are some encouraging signs for retail. So in the at least in the quarter three, NACRI um, Odyssey Index uh, retail actually exceeded all the other sectors. So as we get the fourth quarter data on that, and maybe as we get some other data on on uh, advanced retail spending, I'll, I'll probably update that piece. But um, it's live on the Altus website if you our listeners want to take a look. Um, but really enjoy digging into grocery retail trends. It's a, a sector that I, I'm quite interested in. So. Um, but um, I know you have some some other announcements and stuff stuff that's up on the website too. You want to tell us um, what's going on with the CRE sentiment and expectation survey? Certainly. So the uh, commercial real estate industry conditions and sentiment survey uh, is live. This is uh, we've done a few iterations of this survey over the last couple of quarters. Uh, the survey is intended to really help gather insights into the market sentiment, conditions, uh, key metrics, and really issues affecting the CRE industry as a whole. And uh, it really dives into these topics from the individual practitioner's perspective, uh, representing really all functions and up and down the capital stack. It is open for everybody to uh, participate in. I highly encourage you to participate in it. Um, and it is uh, anonymous, uh, but if you do provide your email at the, at the end of the survey, we, we'll send you all the data that, that backs uh, the, the results. Um, so I encourage you to take it and uh, um, share it with your colleagues, share it with your, your, your uh, you know, associates and, uh, and any professional or anybody in, in, in CRE who you think might be interested in uh, either getting the uh, insights or, or also getting the data behind it. Um, 
but I know that we have a uh, pretty busy macro uh, and economic uh, release schedule ahead this week. So, Cole, what should what should folks be paying attention to? Yeah, you know, this is not an exhaustive list. There are a bunch of uh, data releases this week and some we've already discussed, but um, on the 30th. So by the time we would have um, this would have been released, we'll have consumer confidence data along with the uh, uh, FOMC's rate decision. So the Fed's rate decision. Um, and then on the 1st, so February 1st, we have the ISM manufacturing index. Uh, construction spending also comes out that day. Um, and then on the 2nd, we'll have uh, payroll data, unemployment, and average hour early earnings. So getting an idea of the, you know, a lot of different uh, ideas about the job market this week. Um, so that's what I'll be paying attention to. And hopefully we can report some of that data back to folks um, in a couple of weeks. But Omar, I think that is all the time we've got today. Um, I look forward to speaking with you on another episode of CRE Exchange. Have a good one.